Hi there, and thanks for joining us as we paint a drug picture of the thiazide and the thiazide-like diuretics. Hydrochlorothiazide and bendroflumethiazide are thiazide diuretics, while metolazone is an example of a thiazide-like diuretic. Hydrochlorothiazide, bendroflumethiazide, and metolazone are going to excrete sodium at the level of the kidneys, and with the excretion of the sodium, the water will follow. So they're good in edematous conditions, such as congestive heart failure and liver failure. And they're also good with people who have hypertension because of the fact that they decrease the blood pressure by about 12 millimeters of mercury on average. The thiazide diuretics are the first line therapy for uncomplicated hypertension in the United States. However, in other countries that differs because in the UK, the first line therapy for uncomplicated hypertension are the calcium channel blockers in Australia, uh, first-line therapy for the hypertension is the ACE inhibitor. The diuretics work at the level of the nephron in the kidneys. So let's go into the kidneys and see what they do. We normally have two kidneys, and each kidney has an average of 1.2 million functional units called the nephron. In the nephron, blood is filtered through the glomerulus, and then the filtrate, or pre-urine, goes through a number of different areas. And these include the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting ducts. The filtrate that remains at the end of the collecting ducts is then the urine. It's not able to be reabsorbed back into the blood or changed at all. In any one of those areas of the nephron, if the carrier proteins that are embedded in the cell surface of the nephron allow a substance to go from the lumen of the nephron to the other side, which is the interstitial space, it's very possible that that substance will get reabsorbed into the blood because we've got a lot of capillaries or sometimes called capillaries there in the interstitial space that are there specifically to do just that reabsorb substances back into the blood. With the exception of the osmotic diuretics, which are pharmacologically inert, all diuretics exert their effects either directly or indirectly on one or more of those carrier proteins. And therefore, they affect the reabsorption of some of the electrolytes. With respect to the thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, bendroflumethiazide, and metolazone, they exert their effect right here at the distal convoluted tubule. And when you're trying to picture the thiazide diuretics, think of them as doing three things. Firstly, the thiazide diuretics decrease the sodium chloride symporter, which would normally save sodium from being excreted. The net result and most important thing about that is that it wastes sodium and along with wasting the sodium, you're going to waste the water as well. So you're going to get rid of sodium and water. And then potassium is also wasted further down the nephron, at least partly due to this action. Point number two is that the thiazide diuretics also affect the calcium channel, which saves calcium. 
In this case, the thiazide diuretics actually increase the actions of the TPR5 transporter. So the net result and most important action of this one is that it's going to save calcium and waste magnesium. And then finally, just to upset the people with gout, thiazide diuretics act in another place altogether, which is the proximal convoluted tubule. And there it's going to increase the reabsorption back into the bloodstream of the uric acid. In other words, we keep more uric acid in the blood. So by knowing what happens at the level of the kidneys, we did a pretty good job at predicting the side effects and complications, but there were some side effects and complications that we couldn't predict from just that. The reason that the Thiazide diuretics are no longer the first-line therapy in Australia is because of the fact that they actually increase the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and they also increase the level of lipids in some people. A lot of the electrolyte disturbances that are caused by thi thiazide diuretics are going to be able to be lessened or even eliminated by taking them along with another diuretic. For instance, the potassium sparing diuretics or the ACE inhibitors. And as a matter of fact, uh, there's uh, frequently a combination of ACE inhibitors and thiazide-like diuretics which are taken in one pill. Some of the contraindications of thiazide Diuretics include pregnancy and lactation. Remember that the thiazide-like diuretics and the thiazide diuretics actually get into the breast milk, so that is a contraindication. Also, allergy to sulfur-containing medications is a contraindication. As we talked about before, the thiazide-like diuretics and the thiazide diuretics will actually increase the level of uric acid in the system, and therefore they're contraindicated in people with gout, and finally they're contraindicated in people with renal failure. They're not very effective in people with reduced renal function. And then finally, there is one other time you may actually see the thiazide diuretics being used, and that would be to su supplement other therapies in people with osteoporosis. Because not only do the thiazide diuretics actually retain the calcium, so giving the person more calcium in the system to build those bones, but there's also seems to be a stimulation of the osteoblasts or the bone building cells.